Hey there students! In this lecture I'm going to go over the difference between positive and negative liberty. Now this comes from the essay written by Isaiah Berlin in 1958 entitled Two Concepts of Liberty. Quick shout out to Tom Turner, one of my own students who loves freedom very much. So let's go ahead and look at these two concepts of liberty, negative liberty and positive liberty. Negative liberty can be defined as the freedom from outside interference, the operative word being from, whereas positive liberty is the freedom to act upon one's will, the operative word being to. So the distinction here is freedom from something and freedom to be able to do something. In the language of negative liberty, I might say, I am no one's slave, whereas in the language of positive liberty, I would say, I am my own master. Negative liberty is defined in the language of natural right, whereas positive liberty can be defined in the language of entitlement. Now, both of these definitions are about freedom, but it's nuanced, and I'm going to go into those nuances and why it matters to a lot of people today. So, negative liberty really involves a zone of non-interference, that freedom is my ability to operate within a certain sphere where no one else is interfering with me. Whereas positive liberty is the ability for me to achieve my goals regardless of who may be interfering and who may not be interfering. Now there are some freedoms that we have such as religious freedom that we could look at in terms of negative or positive liberty. If we're going to look at religious freedom in terms of negative liberty, we would look at freedom from interference in my religious practice, whereas positive liberty would define this as the freedom to practice the religion of my choosing. Now, religion in terms of positive liberty, you could look at the Bible when the Jews are given money by the Persian king, Cyrus the Great, to go back and rebuild their temple. They wanted to go back to Jerusalem. They wanted to worship at their temple. And Cyrus the Great made this freedom possible, made it possible for them to do what they wanted to do through interference. Now, this challenges the definition of negative liberty. Now, we typically understand the rights that we have in America, at least constitutional rights, in terms of negative liberty. When we think about the Declaration of Independence, that Jefferson wrote about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that you have the right to be alive, you have the right to be free, and you have the right to pursue happiness without interference from someone else. You don't necessarily have the right to be happy, but you may pursue happiness as you see fit without someone else needlessly getting in the way. And John Stuart Mill wrote in the language of negative liberty when he wrote about the two maxims of liberalism. These maxims are first, that the individual is not accountable to society for his actions insofar as these concern the interest of no person but himself. Secondly, that for such actions as are prejudicial to the interest of others, the individual is accountable and may be subjected either to social or legal punishment. So when we ask John Stuart Mill and we evaluate these maxims, liberty is really about being able to do what you want as long as you are not hurting anyone else. When we look at the First Amendment of the United States Constitution, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So you see here that the First Amendment is written in the language of negative liberty protecting people from interference from this new federal government in the rights of expression. So Congress will not make any law respecting an establishment of religion so they won't create a state church and they won't prohibit someone from practicing their religion freely. So the First Amendment is written in the language of negative liberty and non-interference. Now the question is, negative liberty is great until you find yourself unable to attain your goals due to lack of resources. Take Booker T. Washington, for example, in his book, Up From Slavery. Great book. This is a guy that was a college president 
who was born as a slave. And in the first chapter of Up From Slavery, Booker T. Washington writes about his memory as a boy of the Union Army coming to his plantation where he grew up and reading the Emancipation Proclamation. And the Emancipation Proclamation was read and everybody's first reaction was, yes, you know, we're free and that's awesome. But then there was kind of a follow-up reaction. What now? I'm free, but I don't have any property. I don't have any money. I don't have any marketable skills. So these slaves that were freed at that time, were they truly free? Yes, in the negative sense, they were free because they didn't have a master, but they weren't free in the positive sense because really when it comes down to it, what could they do? And this is where we ask ourselves, should all members of society have things like education, health care, employment, food? Do people have a right to eat, a right to be fed, a right to be taken care of when they're sick? Now, in a state of nature, they certainly don't have that right. But in our civilized society, do we recognize these rights? And I'd like to kind of employ Newton's first law of motion. When viewed in an inertial reference frame, an object either remains at rest or continues to move at constant velocity unless acted upon by force. So if you're the person who has property, you're the person who has money and education and food and all of this kind of stuff, then you're free. You can do whatever you want in an atmosphere of non-interference, that you are the object in motion that will stay in motion. But then what about the person who is not in that position. What about the person who does not have money, does not have education, does not have access to health care and all of those kinds of things? Is that person free? In the positive sense, that person is not free in the sense that they are not able to achieve their goals. So while Jefferson symbolizes negative liberty, let's look at FDR's four freedoms. In 1941, FDR gave his four freedoms speech where he said that every human being should have these four rights, freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. When you look at the first two of these, these are negative liberties. That FDR is speaking in terms of negative liberty here at first, uh, these traditional American rights. The right to be able to speak freely and worship freely without someone interfering with you. And then he goes on to speak about freedom from want and freedom from fear. These are positive liberties that he's talking about. That these are things like, I have a right not to be needy. I have a right not to be afraid. These are not natural rights. These are what we would call entitlements of living in a civilized free society. Now, the modern libertarian movement led by people like Ron Paul, they do not believe in the concept of positive liberty because their assessment of this is that two people cannot both be free if one of them has to take from the other in order to be free. If we look at John Stuart Mill, that the person owes nothing to society as long as they're doing nothing to harm society. But in order to actually implement positive liberty, you're going to have to redistribute wealth and resources. So if somebody doesn't have health care, education, or something like that, then the government will have to provide that so that person can achieve their goals. If that person has been discriminated against, something like affirmative action. So libertarians will say that this really isn't right because one person's freedom is being compromised for another person's freedom. Now at the same time, without any redistribution, the portion of the population without wealth, education, employment, that portion is not free. So if we were to look at things in terms exclusively of negative liberty, then there is a portion of the population that is unfree because they lack these resources. It's almost like Rousseau said, man is born free, but everywhere he is in chains. That everybody can't seem to be free at one time. Liberty is very complicated. And that's why we continue to have this discussion between the Jeffersonian concept of negative liberty and this uh, more 20th century Roosevelt uh, sort of concept of 
positive liberty, which also incorporates negative liberties as well. So hopefully you learned a little something about liberty. If you like what you heard, subscribe to my channel, TomRitchie.net, social media, Twitter, Instagram, all of that kind of stuff. Plenty more where this came from. Until next time.